All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, my presentation, I think, is the next one up. Um, so, yep, just as Andy said, um, I'm here from General Motors, and I'm very excited to talk to you all today. Just as a brief introduction, um, I am from the Virtual Design Development and Validation Department. And my title with uh, the areas that I work in is Thermal, Aero, Chassis, <laughs> Loads Prediction, and Vehicle Dynamics. So now that I've gotten my title out, the hard part is over, and we can um, enjoy the, the rest of the discussion. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about why I'm so excited to be in front of you all today. Um, I had to think back and think, how long have I been working with virtual tools? And the answer to that is actually 17 years. Um, and so I wanted to have a show of hands. Has anyone been working with virtual tools uh, either 17 years or longer? I'd love to see it. I knew there was going to be a lot of you. So we have some of the best and brightest in the business um, today. I see many familiar faces. And um, this is really a space where I'm very passionate about and that I have experience in. Um, and that I, re I really care about the future of the strategy. The second reason that I'm really excited to talk to you today is because, like many of you, COVID has affected our way of life so much, and I'm really happy that we get together today um, in, a, in a celebratory way as the world starts to kind of open back up a little bit more. Um, I know that I'm still working appropriately. I work from home a lot. That's our two-word our two um, HR strategy uh, at General Motors. And I do feel very energized when I get in front of people, especially people like you, who um, are working in the same space as me. So welcome to everyone. And let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I've got this little button here. Don't I? OK. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and you may think to yourself, what does this have to do with a, with a technical conference? But Stay with me, you'll see this theme throughout my, my discussion. So this is a quote by Mr. Rogers. For those of you who don't know Mr. Rogers, he had a very long running TV show for children and it was really geared toward learning and how children learn um, and the importance of that. So the quote is, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. So I wanna, Take everyone back, so I had to think through this. You know, if you raised your hand of 17 or more years of experience, you may have to think back a little bit. Um, but everyone remember when you first started to use virtual tools, and when you first walked into that first day on the job. When I graduated from the University of Michigan and moved to Texas to start working in my first uh, position, I remember just sort of this whole new world opening up for me, right? So I went from learning about physical concepts and using things like hardware um, in my lab classes to actually bringing that all to life on the computer screen. And um, as I learned how to do things like, you know, you would get the mesh on and you would follow the procedure uh, and then your curiosity would start to get the best of you, right? Well, what if I change this? What would this do to the performance of my part? What if I change my mesh? What if I change the load input here? And before you know it, if you follow your natural curiosity, you've already started to create things like um, you know, variation studies or sensitivity studies before you even know that that's a thing. Um, and so I'm asking you all to sort of tap back into that natural curiosity before you were overloaded by you know, the burdens of needing things like program timing or your heavy workload. What were you doing at the beginning of your career? And that's sort of the, the thought process that I want to take you through today. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the disruptive events that have been happening over the past two and a half years and how that has contributed to the way our business and our opportunities are changing. Um, you know, if you remember in January 2020, as COVID started to really take hold, um, it was definitely a scary time for everyone. I was actually working my only job that was not in virtual. I was working um, in front and rear closures at the time. Um, and we were getting ready for a prototype phase of a vehicle. So this is very heavily into getting things like material to make the tools. You know, the material that makes the tools is a you know, huge amount of material. Uh, you know, as the world is sort of starting to shut down, it's harder and harder to have the people to, to make that material. It's harder to have even the people in general who would do that analysis. Um, then, uh, 
not only do you have the tool that makes that part, but then you've got to make the parts themselves and have all of that material and all of those people to support. So I remember being on calls late at night trying to figure out alternative plans to keep my prototype vehicle um, build on time, and it was so difficult. Um, of course then, as COVID came to the US, I remember sitting in a conference room at General Motors um, hearing about different schools shutting down and that General Motors was going to shut down for two weeks, right? Um, two weeks has turned into two and a half years. It's been a little bit longer than that. Um, but it wasn't as scary for me, you know? I, being someone who came from a background with virtual tools, oops, I'm not supposed to touch my microphone, sorry. Um, being someone who came from virtual tools, it was actually a moment that we were ready for, right? We knew how to do this. We've been preparing for this, and we've been waiting for our opportunity to really prove ourselves and take it to the next level. Um, of course, the great resignation, there's a changing workforce happening. Um, my team personally has grown by over 20% in the past two years. That means that there's new engineers coming on. We need ways to um, you know, transfer our knowledge. We need our tools to be intuitive and easy to learn. Um, I found that the, the people who are graduating college and coming to our teams are ready for that information. And um, they have that mindset where they're, they're doing the hard work that is learning but it's also very fun for them, just like the quote in the beginning. And I'm so inspired by that and um, want to continue to see our tools match that energy. Um, of course, then, another unprecedented event, um, the war in Ukraine, which um, really emotionally touched many of our colleagues, but even um, also in addition to that, of course, new supply chain challenges too, right? So this is once again challenging the auto industry when we have the microchip shortage. How are we going to um, combat that and make sure that we're delivering quality products to our customers? Um, now, here we are today. We are continuing to have material shortages. It's not just on the shelves at the grocery stores. It is, of course, with our own vehicles. Um, and it's becoming more and more apparent that these events have put us in a position where we are very passionate and very inspired to affect our products in a way that we've been trained to do. Um, the lack of material makes it harder for us to create these prototype vehicles. If we have to choose between making a prototype vehicle and a vehicle that we can give to our customers, we want to put that energy into a vehicle that we can give to our customers. And if we don't always have the ability to work in person with that hardware, we need to be able to work at home or in the office with our virtual tools. But like I said, right now, our team has consistently delivered um, through working appropriately to all of these challenges. I am so proud of everything that we've accomplished over the past two and a half years. Um, and it, it truly is inspiring to me. Um, one, one more uh, quick story about, about COVID and how it changed me just from a personal standpoint. Um, you know, I, re I remember early in the time, you know, definitely trying to bribe my children to stay quiet for, for periods of time, right? Um, you know, you do 30 minutes of screen time and then you could, you know, get a 30 minute meeting in. I remember taking them in wagons. Uh, they were one and three at the time when COVID hit. You know, walking them around the block so I could get some time to talk to my people, have one-on-ones, things like that. I think that it's important um, that we bring our, our true selves and our full selves to work every day. And I think that COVID has shown us a, a lot of what that means to different people. And I'm um, really excited to celebrate that that means that we not only get to bring our skills to work in a different way, but also bring our personal selves to work in a different way. never know where to point this. There we go. Okay, so all that's happening in the world. Meanwhile, in the auto industry, things are changing as well, right? So the race for the EV market is heating up. So what we're finding is that um, really what, what's being rewarded in the market is the volume of EVs that are on the road now. So there's an incredible demand to get our products on the road faster and to get new technologies to our customers. So our customers are changing, right? Um, the world is changing. We are all so dialed in electronically, even more so with COVID. So how can we bring these features that our customers are demanding um, 
to them faster. We cannot rely on a normal global development program life cycle, right? We have to speed things up. We have to get it to them faster. Otherwise, companies who are very competitive, startups, who are not held back by um, you know, 100 years of processes are, are going to outrun us. So that's how we feel at General Motors, that we need to remain agile and fast. And the ultimate benefit is that our customers will get products to them much faster. So as you see this heating up, um, there was also another public article, Cadillac Lyrics Development Accelerated by Virtual Testing and Validation. Um, right here you see a snapshot using PowerFlow of the Lyric and some of the virtual development that we had going on. In fact, the person who made that is speaking later today, Danilo. He's right here in the audience too. Good job, Danilo. Um, and you know what's really impressive about this is that um, so the chief engineer of the Lyric really believed in um, you know in using this and the power of using this for the Lyric. And I'm so glad that she really bought into that strategy and she saw the benefit of it. And you know, when you have a pioneer like that really latch onto something and use it and then see the benefit, we were able to pull up the Lyric production um, you know, by many months, nine months, which was released to the public ahead of schedule. And um, you know, as you can see by the article, much of that was um, given credit to our virtual development. So what does that mean for us? So at General Motors, we have a vision called Vision 2025. Um, and what this is is a, a vision of an all virtual um, development cycle um, by 2025. Right now, our teams are working to define what this would look like and um, what sort of hardware are we willing to reduce, um, what sort of new technologies and new procedures do we need in order to support this? What new tools do we need to support this? What is the opportunity here, right? We already talked about the opportunity. The opportunity is that we, we want to be first to the EV market, we want to bring value to our customers, um, and, and we want to um, you know, be first in the market. Mary has really pulled no punches and says that she wants to be first, right? And she wants to be the best. So how can we do that? I firmly believe that using virtual tools is one of the ways that we do that. So what does this mean? Um, this vision was shared with all of our suppliers um, within the past few months. So it is knowledge that I feel comfortable sharing with you and the title of Vision 2025. So um, what's happening? So we're talking about transformation. That's uh, in 2019, we underwent organizational changes to support some of this activity. COVID accelerated that again by actually removing some of those things that we were holding on to based on our previous ways of doing things. It forced us to change and it forced us to move forward. We want to keep that momentum. We don't, as the world opens back up, we don't want to go back to our old way of doing things. Just like any great engineer, we want to learn from those and we want to continue on forward and make it even better, right? So um, now, we can reduce tests, we can reduce hardware, and we can make sure that that first vehicle that we produce is no longer a prototype, but rather something that we can sell to our customers. Um, and this is not just within the VDDV team. This is a, a company-wide initiative that everyone is in. You know, we, we can't do it alone as one organization. We need everyone to be thinking this way and see the same opportunities that we do. I'll figure out where to point this by the end of the, by the, end of the discussion. So um, what is all virtual? What does that mean? And that's something that we've been talking a lot about at General Motors. You know, what, what exactly does all virtual mean? What's in, what's out, right? So in simplest terms, it means that the first vehicle is good enough to sell. So instead of the first vehicle being something that we test on, of course, we, you know, we have to do certain things for regulatory, for confirmation, for validation. But our vision, it's important to have a, a strong, forward-looking vision um, that we can all run to because if we make it, if we make it softer, or if we pull it back or put it farther out in the future, we will lose that urgency 
um, that, were, that we had coming off of all of the global challenges that we had. Um, we don't run with hardware as part of our vehicle development process. No prototypes. So the thought of getting a vehicle to learn on, to break and fix and break and fix, um, we don't want that. So, so what does that mean for our virtual analysis? Well, it means that there's certain interactions that you would get for free in a vehicle, right? A fully built vehicle that you now have to learn how to build into your models and think through, you know, uh, maybe we're doing majority of component analysis, but what about when we put all of that together, right? What about the full integration of the vehicle? Um, that's something that we would normally see at the prototype phase where we could record that and, and we could make changes, right? So how can we see that way up front and earlier in time um, to affect the design and our final tools? And this drives rigorous engineering up front. Everything we do today physically is in scope. So it's really going back to when you first, you know, learned all these engineering principles, you started to play with these virtual tools for the first time in your career. Um, what did you want to learn? What did you want to drive forward? You have to have that curiosity once again to embrace working in a different and new way. Okay, so what is holding us back? COVID clearly showed us the power of fast innovations. You know, I was really inspired during the early days of COVID watching um, you know, GM and fellow automakers and all sorts of other industries really contributing to the COVID cause. Um, we did have some projects within our team that use virtual tools that I believe you know, led to thoughts that would save lives, right? And that's very important. And when you work toward a certain goal like that and you're all laser focused on it, it's very powerful as a team to get together and do those sorts of things. Um, you know, seeing things like our, our facilities being turned into places where we can manufacture masks, you know, working on respirators, things like that. I was incredibly inspired by what we can do with that. And yes, we can use virtual tools to help us with that, especially when we can't get together because we're sick and not able to see each other face to face. It really is incredibly powerful. Um, so holding us back, due to our complex and fast deliverables, we may lose the time or desire to play. So by that, again, I mean, I, I feel this in my, in my own position. I know that I talk to people who go through this. Um, you know, the demands of the deliverables that you're under every day, we, li we work and live in a fast-paced environment. Um, before we even complete our first assignment, we have our next assignment coming at us, right? So who sometimes has time to really do those sorts of things? Um, I know that things like you know, playing with, with uh, the tool, playing with your model, trying to understand things in a new way, kind of falls on the back burner when you're really trying to deliver results for a launch or a chief or things like that. So um, I invite you to, to make time to recall that part of yourself. Um, whether you've been working for one year or 17 years like me, when you get under the pressure of those deliverables, you can sometimes lose that focus. Fear of failure causes us to avoid risk. So, um, you know, I think we all are determined to make a safe product, um, a great product, and we don't want to fail ourselves and we don't want to fail our company. So sometimes we make decisions to mitigate risk, which totally makes sense. Um, sometimes we do it too much, right? In order to stay relevant in the industry, we do have to sort of um, elevate risk, understand what the true risk is. Is it really um, that we're not going to launch the product or it's not going to be safe? Or are we going to miss our deliverable by a couple days, right? So that's understanding the different values of risk, making sure that you're talking to your leadership and your peers about that, mitigating it in the right way, but not just calling it risk. You know, you have to assign a name to it. It has to be specific. What specifically are you afraid of with certain um, parts of risk? And then mitigate that, come up with a plan. Just to say something is risky is not being specific or going back to the engineering fundamentals that um, would get you there. Also, we choose perfection over speed. So let me be clear. Um, things like safety, uh, truth to the customer. We all expect perfection in that. We demand perfection. Um, but when you're, um, 
let's say you have a singular part that you're doing analysis on, um, what does perfection really mean? Sometimes we get in a loop of trying to make it the perfect part and we forget about everything else going on and the big picture goal, right? So it's very important to make sure that we remind ourselves that speed is the key right now. Um, if we can get a 95% answer within a day versus a 100% answer in a week, let's go for the 95% answer. Let's make a decision and let's move on, right? Um, we choose, uh, sometimes we choose perfection over speed too much. Okay, and so how can our tools help us get there? Um, I have uh, four, four different examples of um, some of the major tools that we have here. So PowerFlow, again, this is the, the, the lyric, and you can see the simulation for PowerFlow up in the top left. So what's really next, and what am I focusing on in this space? So um, really we have to iterate quickly, right? As we eliminate hardware, we're eliminating some of the tools that we have to iterate with physical hardware that's already existing, right? So how can we make sure that we're iterating quickly with Studio um, and defining our key proportions up front? If we do not define these key items up front, we're going to have rework late and that will delay our main goal, which is getting this to the customers faster. Um, something like SimPack, a quick turnaround of results and real-time capabilities are key to respond to questions at the speed of design. So, um, you know, if you normally have a vehicle that you can go out and drive, you would get that question answered right away, right? But what if you don't have that vehicle? The people who are used to driving that vehicle may not trust you if it takes you two weeks to answer the question that they could have gotten done in five minutes. So how can we iterate fast? How can we be sure that we're ready to answer those questions and provide real uh, design decisions? Eyesight, um, it's important to focus on things like automation um, and connecting the dots between different programs. Um, another, another example would be using eyesight for variation. So again, this is kind of one of those things in the sandbox that, you know, how can we think of these problems differently? How can we go through them? Um, and make sure that we have the right tools to connect those dots. And finally, something like Abacus, um, really a bigger focus on the system interactions rather than, than the component analysis. So how are these systems interacting together? Um, again, we would have found in the prototype phase some of these interactions for free. Um, now we have to model these. We have to understand them up front, and we have to be sure that we're putting them up front with robust engineering practices in the design. All right, so really a call to action for everyone. Um, I, I can't say enough how much I really respect the, the sort of intellectual capacity that we have in this room. I bet you that if we added up the years of experience, it would be incredible. So um, knowledge is not going to hold us back. Um, ability, uh, education, those things are not going to hold us back. What will hold us back are things like not driving toward a goal together. The, the basic things of teamwork, right? What are we driving toward? Putting something like Vision 2025 in front of the team is so powerful because now we all have a singular goal that we can run to. Um, us, our suppliers, um, the people providing the tools for us to get there. It's a very clear message and it's a very clear goal. Um, how can we do that? So our tools, um, speed is key. We need ways um, to go faster in our analysis and using our tools. Um, course define approach. If we're early on in the process, can we do something that's coarse and gets us 90% of the way there um, and then later refine it? And how do we really um, communicate those results too? Are we communicating those as a singular number or are we showing the range and what influences that range? Our leadership. Um, and I don't mean um, like your bosses, I mean the leadership that you possess within you as experts. Um, first, understanding how we fit into this new global landscape and our important role in it. Hopefully I described that a little bit for you and, and your role in that and how, how I see that no matter what company or industry you're in. You have the opportunity to be a leader by understanding the global landscape and what we need to do to be successful. 
Um, bring your passion and excitement to this space. Um, not only will your passion and excitement drive you to try new things, it'll also bring new talent towards you and it'll make a team. You know, this is not completed by a singular person. You truly need a team together in order to make this happen. Um, a growth mindset. Make sure that, that you have the ability to play, give yourself the capacity and the time to do it. Learn a new thing, learn a different thing, learn from your peer, um, learn from someone new. I, I learn um, things from the new people who join our team all the time, even if they haven't been in our industry, because we truly believe that when people bring their whole selves to work, that they complete the team and they bring a unique perspective. And actively challenge ourselves when it comes to risk. If you say in your mind, I don't want to do this, it's too risky, make sure that you are backing that up with engineering principles and fully defining that. If you hear someone say, there's too much risk here, make sure that they tell you what that is. Um, because simply using the word risk isn't going to solve a problem. But understanding if it's risk of workplace of choice, risk of um, you know, safety, you can, you can solve certain issues and you can make plans to mitigate those risks if you actually put a name to it. And for our analysis, let's remember to rely on engineering fundamentals. Um, you know, you have the knowledge and the power within you to, to definitely do that and have a childlike curiosity about learning and using our tools in new ways. You know, much like my sons, being at home with them um, during COVID at the, year, the ages of one and three, I get to watch their natural passions develop and I get to really inspire them to do more through those passions. And I bet you that all of you became engineers for a certain reason. Um, and if you remember those reasons, it will inspire you to continue on this path if you see the opportunity. And that's all. So thank you so much for listening. And I can't wait to see what you all do.